Good morning, everybody. It's just so wonderful to see you here at the beginning of day three of White What. The last two days have completely exceeded my very high expectations, and I really want to thank every one of you who are here in St. Louis, everyone's participating as well on the live cast. Uh, thanks for showing up and injecting this jolt of energy into our technology community. It's been just terrific. I know we're going to have a, a very strong finish this morning as well, but today, of course, is not an ordinary day. And so it's really important that we take a moment to reflect on the, the events of September 11th, 2001. And you know, every one of us experienced that terrible day in our own way, but we also experienced it together. And of course, in the weeks and the months and the years that followed, that day changed the lives of every American and countless others around the world in ways that are still reverberating today all these years later. So to help us pay tribute, to those whom we lost on September 11th and in its aftermath, and to remind us that even world-changing events are the sums of countless individual stories. We've asked five individuals who are here with us for Wait What to recount their personal stories in just a moment or so, and to tell us what they experienced on that fateful day. So I'd ask you please to give your attention to Mick Maher, a DARPA program manager, Captain Rich Field, our Navy liaison, Meredith Saunders, one of the organizers of this event, Mark Masiri, a DARPA program manager, and Victoria Coleman, a technology executive and a member of the Defense Science Board. After these five individuals speak for a minute or so each, Please remain silent for a moment of remembrance, after which our program will resume. In 2001, I was working for a large aerospace corporation. I was content and happy. That was until September 11th. I started in the morning going over the master schedule for the factory and the manpower requirements that would be needed in order for us to make our financial goals by the end of the year. I thought the analysis I was doing was critical and it had my total focus. And then suddenly, our country was under attack. A deep sense of helplessness, helplessness overcame me. And that night, with my family close by, I thought about what really mattered to me. I knew that I needed to change. Out of that reflection, I noticed that our country was coming together like it had never come before. This was the change that I needed. I decided to do something more than just make sure that we hit our year and, and numbers. Shortly afterwards, I would change careers and join the Army Research Lab. I was part of a team developing technologies to support our warfighter that included designing and fabricating the Humvee up armor kits that were being sent overseas. Every day that I went to work, I knew that I was making a difference and hopefully saving lives. Today I still work at the Defense Department, part of a huge cadre of people that were awakened and transformed by 9-11. And so today as we remember the tragic events of that day, let's also remember how we came together. Because I feel like the work that we do is still changing the world. And that for those that gave their lives that day, it's something that they could be proud of. When the 9-11 attacks happened, I was standing watch in the Combat Information Center of the USS Philippine Sea. 
We were on the tail end of a successful deployment to the Arabian Gulf, where our primary duty was protecting the carrier of the USS Enterprise. We were on our way to a well-deserved port visit in Cape Town, South Africa, when we got the initial news. The initial news I got was a simple chat from the staff watch officer. It said, a plane had just flown into one of the towers in New York City. The news after that was slow to come in. Details were scarce, but it just kept getting worse. First they notified us about the other plane and tower, then the Pentagon. We were roughly off the coast of Somalia when the watch officer notified us and said, turn around, make best speed back to the Gulf of Oman. Suddenly our joyous trip home had turned into a prelude to war. We spent the next month off the coast of Pakistan, protecting several carriers and amphibious ships as they sent forces forward into Afghanistan. We also participated in the initial volley of uh, tomahawk strikes into that country. It was a strange mix of feelings at the time. I can remember thinking to myself, wow, this feels good, being part of the effort against these horrible terrorists. But at the same time, I had always thought that in a situation like this, where I was at the tip of the spear, my family would be safe at home. I will always remember when I had that awful thought for the first time that as I sat there in my combat information center on the ship, I felt like I was in a safer place than my own home. On September 11th, I was in the eighth grade and living in Northern Virginia. Walking into my second period civics class, my teacher had the television tuned to coverage of the North Tower in flames. She had been trying to get us to read the news and get up to speed on current events. That day, she said, it will never get more current than this. We watched the second plane hit the South Tower and feelings of confusion and uneasiness began to spread. After a while, coverage switched to the Pentagon, which was in flames. And those feelings of confusion and uneasiness became something so much more. Some of my friends had parents who worked in that building. Later that day, after being escorted home by a family friend and watching hours of news coverage, but still not really knowing what was going on, my mother, who worked in downtown Washington as a lawyer, came home from work. Amazingly, she had walked the entire way after her building had been evacuated and roads and transit were closed. We later learned that one of her law partners, Todd Rubin, had been in the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. 9-11 was my painful introduction to a wider world. I had never heard of Osama bin Laden, couldn't find Afghanistan on a map, and couldn't understand how Al-Qaeda, or anyone really, could hate the United States so much that they would be willing to kill Todd Rubin, or even me. The bubble I was living in completely burst. Now I'm part of the first generation to grow up trying to balance the need to keep the world safe without losing the freedom and joy that come with living in an open and democratic society. I never met Todd Rubin, but I know he would want me, would want all of us, to learn the lessons of 9-11 and keep working to make the world not only safer, but also better. On the morning of September 11th, our university lab in Florida received a call from our program manager at DARPA. There was an attack in New York, and the robots that we were developing were needed for the rescue effort. It would normally be strange for academics to respond to a national disaster, but our group had been researching robots response for several years. Prior to the attack, the program manager had always encouraged us to explore other applications for our DOD robots. I still remember his animated, booming voice saying, you do everything you need to do to fulfill your obligations to DARPA. But after five o'clock, I fully expect you to take this equipment down to the firehouse or police station and see what they can do with it. So on the morning of 9-11, we packed up our lab's equipment. We gathered our personal belongings and we went north. For the next 11 days, we worked on the smoldering heat that had once been the World Trade Center, using our robots to search for survivors. 
It was simultaneously one of the best and worst tests of us and our equipment and one of the harshest environments we could have ever imagined. To say that the events of 9-11 impacted my life would be an understatement. I was humbled by and then fell in love with the community of emergency responders that I was trying to support. So after graduating, I became a firefighter, and today I'm a member of one of the 28 FEMA search and rescue teams, in addition to my role developing technology at DARPA. The events of 9-11 inspire me every day to be a better program manager. To this day, I carry the words of that original program manager. As the people I work with will tell you, I remind them constantly that the investments that they make in breakthrough technologies may pay off in ways that they never imagined. And that the most important work that they do in their careers may happen after five o'clock. Bernard Brown, Jr. Asia Cotton. Rodney Dickens. Three sixth graders, all aged 11, full of excitement, heading west for a school trip to the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Santa Barbara. The date was September 11, 2001. My youngest son, Alex, was barely eight months old that day when the plane carrying Bernard, Asia, and Rodney struck the Pentagon. I knew when that happened that in a very real way, he too was fair game in the eyes of Al-Qaeda. Why? What crime was he guilty of that deserved such punishment? He was guilty of having been born an American. Of course, that made 9-11 personal. In the years since 2001, my children have flown between California and Washington on their own school trips. Thankfully, in a thousand different ways, we have made our skies safer. Behind each one of those ways, there is a mother, a father, a family member, just like me, working to make our country stronger. As a scientist and as a mother, I have obeyed the imperative. I have tried to do my part supporting the Defense Department as an advisor to strengthen national security. As some of you may have guessed, unlike my children, I grew up abroad, at first in Greece and later in the United Kingdom before making the United States my home. Ladies and gentlemen, I was not born an American, but I can tell you September 11th, 2001 was the day I became one. skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain Amen. is 
clean undimmed by human tears America America God shed his grace on